event where uh, we are talking about some of the most pressing and important biblical issues in our cultural moment, not just um, broadly in uh, in Western culture, but particularly within evangelicalism. Uh, my name is Jeff Wright. I'm here on behalf of Credo Alliance. Uh, I think this is going out mostly to Jared Moore's uh, various channels on the internet. So I'm guessing you're familiar with him, but Dr. Jared Moore is there. And uh, we are blessed to have the opportunity to be joined by Kent and Rosaria Butterfield. I'm guessing probably anyone who tunes into this is familiar with Mrs. Butterfield's work. Um, she has a long academic career and uh, an important testimony to the goodness of Christ. Uh, Kent is her husband and shepherd her shepherded her through these things and walked with her in them. And so, um, guys, welcome. Thanks for being here. It is a real treat to have y'all on. Uh, and Kent, in particular, honestly, brother, it's great to see you. I mean, we get to see Rosario so often in different, different formats, but to have you join us here is a real treat. So thanks for making time for this. Well, thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Well, hey, if if we can get started with the conversation, and and friends, those of you who are tuning in, we're here sort of generally to talk about Jared's book, The Lust of the Flesh, um, which Rosario was kind enough to uh, Rosario was kind enough to endorse. But we hope this is kind of a broad branching conversation. Um, and one of the ways I want to start here, Kent, is actually talking to you. It seems like you've been very intentional about um, shepherding your wife uh, in what ministry she'll engage with, how she'll engage with them. Uh, and I'm yeah, assuming, yeah. feel free to correct me on this, I'm assuming that's mm -hmm. because some of the most significant parachurches, uh, parachurch organizations in evangelicalism right now are not handling the issue of sexuality faithfully. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we also live in this moment where telling someone no or saying no, because I think you're wrong seems so, uh, you know, just so very mean spirited. So how did you think through um, guiding your wife in her, uh, her engagement on this issue? And I hope that, I'm, but I'm, I'm hoping yeah. it gives you a lot of room to talk broadly. Yeah. Well, we are definitely in a day where it seems like everyone has a blog. Actually blogs don't, are talked about much. It's all about, you know, podcasts now. Um, so there's not just churches out there and well-established ministries like a seminary, but, you know, it's endless of groups or individuals, you know, who uh, want to engage um, and, you know, you can't talk to everybody. Um, that's, that's just a reality. Uh, but you know, the, the groups, individuals, um, who have really no accountability because they're not really tied mm -hmm. to a church or maybe they're, you know, in a church and they're the elder of one, you know, it's hard to engage people like that if they are, you know, in gross error, uh, teaching falsely what the scriptures teach. The, those people want, want to have made a lot of dialogue on email and then, you know, put something on their podcast. Um, but you know, if, if they wanted to, like, I want to learn truth or I want to learn your understanding of scripture because I might be wrong, then, yeah, that'd be a great opportunity to have conversation. It might not be public, but when they just want to have approval um, but they're not going to reconsider their positions. I think it's just uh, pointless. Uh, there's no profit in it. Um, you're uh, basically throwing pearls before swine. Mm. They say that, you know, they want to engage, but for what reason? Mm -hmm. You know, for the reputation, for them to be uh, vindicated in some way, but not engaging in the scripture itself. So I, I think, you know, we have to deal with only people who are serious, uh, those people who have accountability system, um, those who are, you know, humble enough to acknowledge, you know, they don't know everything and they might be in error. And we all should be in that position uh, at any given time. Uh, so uh, it's not, you know, a lot of people treat Christianity and uh, on the as you know, a popularity contest and 
I know. I never won. I never won that at school <laughs> in any grade. So uh, I'm going to try to do it now. And I think it'd be pointless uh, for my wife to kind of spin her wheels uh, as well. Yeah, you're hitting on a real dilemma there uh, in this era of church history. I, I know there's always been more gifted, you know, teachers or those who could draw more uh, attention to themselves. But celebrity Christianity is sort of a it's a it's a strange beast. I was talking on another podcast just this week, actually, about how squaring up the parachurch church with the local church is just a bizarre endeavor. You mentioned the accountability thing. Um, I've profited from parachurch church ministries. So I'm thankful in some ways from that. Right. But again, there's not an elder body sitting on top of them. And then, um, you know, the promises aren't to the parachurch, right? The, you know, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. That doesn't mean uh, the parachurch is, is insulated. And it looks like maybe the gates of hell have made some gainway uh, on some of these parachurches. So I appreciate your point about celebrity Christianity uh, and as, as a popularity contest. I think that's something we would be wise to be aware of, be cautious about, and, and repent uh, of as much as we can. Um, so anyway, thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Jared, I think um, I think I need to hand you the baton so you ask the next question, my friend. I don't want to, I don't want to hog the, uh, the, the microphone. I think they may be losing connection some. Oh, okay. We'll see well, if we can get them back here for a second. Well, friends, if you're watching, thanks for hanging in here. We, um, can't always control everybody's internet connection. So sorry about the hang up there. Are you, uh, are you, are Oh, here they are. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Here yeah. we are. We were going to ask if we should leave and come back or what you'd like us to do. Well, we're glad to be restored. Okay, okay. all right. Yeah, that's good. That's Sorry. good. But well, we right, missed so all the profound you. things you were saying, Jeff. Everything that you said, I know it was even more profound than our last elevator conversation at ACCS, but still, but still. It, it it boiled down basically to thanking Kent for a great answer. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, that's the Cliff's notes. I'll go with um, that. Uh, yes, thank so, you. Jared, I will rehand the mic back to you because I think you've uh, got a follow up here. The next question. Yeah. So one question I had was, you know, I've heard folks in the the so-called gay Christian movement, they refer to themselves as side B. Um, I've heard them claim that same sex attraction is not a sin because it is it's a pre lust desire. And so the question I have for, for both of you is, do you see this pre lust desire category in scripture? And second, how has rhetoric or turn of phrase fueled and advanced this movement? Hmm. Um, uh oh, internet's cutting in and out, isn't it? Uh oh, okay. you hear us? Uh -oh. are we back? Do you want us to log yeah, off can... and come back in? Is there something wrong? Um, is y'all's do, uh, do you hear us? Is, is y'all's internet uh, fast? I'm not sure how to answer that question. We did. I mean, we do. We do a lot of. Uh, you know, I do. A, yeah, I do a lot of podcasts all the time. I really here. do. Like right from here, this is the spot. But um, that's wild. But that's I'll, wild. I mean, I can certainly. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if um, it's got it. I think, we're, I, don't know. I think we're good now. Are we okay? Yeah, I yeah, think we're okay. All right, I can. But that, that, Jared, that's a really good question. I think we both, you know, I, I, definitely we've seen, um, you know, with the rise of therapy and the rise of the kind of the empathy movement, um, and this, uh, you know, and I, and I would say the rise of, uh, and I just say, heresies a little bit. Of a little bit of semi-Pelagian, some Roman Catholic ideas that are stepping into the forefront of what is sin. I, I, I definitely think that that um, the replacement of slow of, of of scripture for slogans has been so devastating and so dangerous for the the person that I used to be. I often think about that, right? You know, doctrine matters, and. 
I don't know what it would have been like for me if I had walked into a church, uh, you know, that that looks like some of the 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 big parachurch, you know, the parachurch ministries today. Um, you know, when I was was uh, in some ways asking some of these questions as a woman who was a lesbian and an activist and other things, I think it would have been terrible. I think the first time somebody said, hey, we here's our revoice, you know, uh, program and we just need a lesbian bowling league and we need to know, you know, how things go from your perspective. can underestimate how much we are actually putting by denying the repentance uh, uh, you know that same sex attraction to sin is actually that the heresy that's actually it. Like we could spend our unpack why that is such a dangerous idea. Did we lose? No, we still, we still hear you right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what the, what the deal is with the internet. Do you want me um, to get off and get back on? We can, we can try it. We can try it. You want to try it? Get back off and okay. And come back on. Sorry, everybody. We'll try it. Get off. And okay. Get back, back on. Okay. What's that other tab you got? Well, while we're waiting, Jared, um, we're. Do you think were you the first to call this same sex attraction normalization stuff heresy? Uh, did she beat you to the punch on that? I I know that's kind of become common in our circles, and it kind of shocks people who aren't with us. I think it's true. I'm just curious who the first you know who the first was to say that. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know on the first. Um, I think I say it in my dissertation back in 2019. Okay. Um, but um. But I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. There's I'm confident. Little... I'm confident that church history is going to come down on that side, at least by the time of the New Jerusalem. You know, uh, but I think it's still shocking for people who, I don't know, are more sympathetic to the, to the rhetoric of the pro revoice theology people. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's sad, man. The uh... There's just a lack of knowledge on church history, and I mean it's uh, and it's more rhetoric. Um, I mean, I just asked, uh, you know, I just spoke with Gregory Coles briefly, just on Twitter, trying to get him to debate me in a public forum, and he doesn't want to. Um, but I asked him where he calls same-sex attraction the capacity to be tempted, you know. And um, I asked him where that's at in the Bible, and he admitted that it's no, it's not. He he has no reference for in Scripture, but it's, but it's usually how people describe their attraction. Yeah, and I'm just like, I I can't even register with that. I can't even think like that because because if you do that with every sin, you know it's going to be. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back. I don't know. Y'all fixed it. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> praying everybody. <laughs> yeah, y'all yeah, pray. Y'all pray. Rosario, continue. Um, continue what you were saying on same-sex attraction as far as it being heresy. Could yeah, you I, and I, I, yeah. And I know people hate it when I say that word, uh, but I, I really am a wordsmith. I'm somebody who chooses my words carefully. I. I'm not. I'm not losing my temper right now. I, I haven't lost my ability to think of other synonyms. I, you know, it's it's actually it, we are living church history right now. We are playing it out, and and when um, when the church has already called this a heresy. I mean, side B gay Christianity is not new. 
uh, it, it is uh, Pelagiast and it is Roman Catholic and it is neo-Orthodoxy. And, um, and we can unpack all of those, but to deny that um, progressive sanctification is held out uh, to all who, um, who have uh, repented and believe and put their hope in the resurrected Christ, to act as though the resurrection has no authority or power over the deeds of the flesh is absolute, uh, it, is, it is from the pit of hell. We know that homosexuality is found in the flesh. It, it is uh, forbidden in the law and it is overcome in the savior. And it doesn't matter if you insert a slogan or a, or a neologism like sexual orientation or, or if you decide that your will or your volition is more important, it just, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's a great comfort to a sinner. It's a great comfort to know that the risen Christ is, is, um, is, is cheering you on. I mean, is actually interceding for you. But I think the issue, and, you, and Jared, you talk about this in your book really well. Mark Jones talks about it in his book as well. I mean, we have so many good, uh, you know, really good messages out there, but it's a misreading of James 1. And it is this assumption that, um, that instead of James 1 being a kind of life cycle of sin, you know, like the life cycle of the butterfly that we all have on our walls in our science classroom, um, you know, it... it it's to deny someone the opportunity to learn to mortify his or her sin at the moment that you actually could beat it is so uh, it's just barbaric. You know, when, when are, when am I more likely to have any ability to beat my sin when it's a, 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 you know, an embryo, a temptation, a, a, a sinful temptation, or when it's a giant. And so the actual heresy is this idea that, and I, and you know, people publicly say this. In fact, they're very proud of this um, on the, you know, side B gay Christian side. Um, you know, same sex attraction is not a sin, acting on it is as though there is no will and volition in desire. It's just, it, you know, it's just unconscionable. But I don't know anybody other than Satan who wants to deny you the right to repent. I really don't. And so that's, you know, and that's also why I was really excited about Jared's book, Happy to Blurb It. It actually, um, it, it reminded me of a, of a book that uh, Pastor Ken Smith gave to me when I had first walked through the doors of, I mean, I didn't walk through the door of the church for a long time. So I was walking through the door of his house a lot and he was bringing the gospel to me. And um, he handed me this book by Chris Lundgaard called The Enemy Within. And it was about John Owen's indwelling sin. And, and what Chris Lundgaard did with indwelling sin is what Jared does with concupiscence. And it, it just, it took an idea that I'd never heard of before, that sin could be inside me. And it gave me the tools to think, to pray, to repent. And I'm really hoping that's what Jared's book will do for people. Um, and I think all the controversy around it is just fine because, you know, and it, it, it does seem as though it is becoming increasingly controversial to say the most obvious things. And, um, and there is no way in a post Obergefell world, post Bostock world, uh, world where um, you know parents are castrating their 14-year-olds in the name of Biden's redefinition of the 14th Amendment, where every government school has anti-bullying legislation mandated that teaches uh, you know advocacy for transgenderism. In that context, when you have parachurch ministries blindly um, acting as though being a soft presence in that world is a good thing. We need a book like Jared's in the same way that I needed a book uh, like, like Chris Lundgaard's years ago. So, um, so I think this is the issue. I think this is the heart of the issue. And for all the focus on critical race theory, I know that was a big deal, but that's like breaking your leg. You, you can still get on with life. This is a fatal, you know, if you attack the creation ordinance, if you, if you, um, 
condone a sin that is in rebellion against God's created order, that's a fatal heart attack. And uh, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Jerry, I think you did a great job uh, on on this issue, you know, unpacking um, the first sin with with Eve um, as Satan tempted her. Uh, She saw the fruit. She desired fruit. She uh, saw it was good for food. Um, And unpacking also um, uh, Romans chapter 7, as well as what Rosario made mention Mm -hmm. to uh, James 1. And also you went to James 4 about, uh, you know, why uh, why, why do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? Um, that war in your members, you know, within within us, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war. Um, and, you know, I don't know any serious Christian in my lifetime where we've talked about struggle with our thoughts mm-hmm. or our desires where anyone denied, you know, desiring something that is, unholy that is contrary to the character of god and the commandment of god you know we would all say that is sin and we all have that struggle mm-hmm. um you know all mature christians really have a phd in sin we know how to sin we know to deceive ourselves with sin we, we know how to justify to ourselves not to god uh why we committed our sin and you know we should not be you know, divorcing ourselves from Christian reason that is spelled out in Scripture. And also, you know, the clear teaching of Scripture, like in First John chapter 1, uh, if we say, uh, verse 8, 8 through 10, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we have made him a liar, and his word is not in us. Even non-believers, usually unless they're really hostile publicly, would acknowledge that they are sinners. I think this was saying here, First John, if we're denying a sin that is exposed to us, that we said, no, I didn't sin. If we're denying the sin is sin, or we're denying that we the sin that we committed. We say we didn't commit it. We're, we're a liar, um, and we're, we're not manifesting the truth. Now Christians can do that, but they can't do that for very long. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a yeah. There's no pre-lust desire. <laughs> pre-lust is lust. <laughs> you know, Just and maybe human is a human, right? <laughs> right. Maybe rattlesnake is a rattlesnake. You know, it, it's that there is you know. You know, you know, let, let, lust is is a reality, and it's a serious reality. And let's let's admit it. Most common sins we have are in our heart and are not manifest uh, outwardly. No, it's our, right. our thoughts and our desires. Right. You know, that's, I don't know. It's probably about nine percent of our sins. It is of mine. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sorry. Augustine Augustine says that he thinks that we commit a million sins a day. Um, yeah, because of our heart's inclinations, and mm-hmm. what's what's one of the most sinister things about all this is that. So, if someone tell you know if a pastor tells his congregation that there is a pre lust desire, it sends that Christian running to the mirror to try to figure out well. Am I lusting or, or is it a pre lust desire? And so they're constantly right. running to the mirror instead of to Christ. Right. right. And right. we've got a savior. That's what I that's one thing I don't understand with the side B movement is they claim they have a savior, but they're always running to the mirror. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Constantly running to the mirror. Mm-hmm. And that that's the path to misery. Mm-hmm. That's the path to misery. And so mm-hmm. I'm hopeful to send folks running to Christ, run, mm-hmm. run to him and be healed, run to him and be joyful in him. Like mm-hmm. it, it, that's something else is that, you know, Kent, what you just said, man, like mm-hmm. you're saying that you're just as sinful as these side B people. It's just that you sin differently and me too. Right. I'm just mm-hmm. as 
sinful as these other folks, but I, my joy is in Christ. He, my mm-hmm. sin has been imputed to him. His righteousness has been mm-hmm. credited to me. And that mm-hmm. is where my hope is. And it's out yeah. of it. Right. Well, I, I would go a step further. And I know you would too. Uh, I am a worse sinner than yeah. those or, or you or her or anyone else. You know, I am the chief of sinners. Uh, yeah. I know more of my sins and my, sin, my sins were more grievous since becoming uh, becoming a Christian. Um, and another thing I noticed with side B and you no, know, this is true of other uh, movements that try to advocate, um, you know, some unbiblical practice or teaching. You don't hear much or not at all about Christ, his perfect life, um, being imputed to us. You don't hear about, um, total depravity like we were just talking about you don't hear about the power of regeneration so the holy spirit applying the work of christ uh to to the sinner who is drawn by god's grace uh to christ uh you don't hear about progressive sanctification and the priority that that is for every christian to continue to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling Um, You don't hear about the liberty that Christians have. This is true Christian liberty. It's not about going off and smoking a cigar and drinking whiskey. It is about you are free in Christ now to do the will of God. Of course, we need the the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. These are liberating and glorious doctrinal truths that the Christian church has always embraced. The true Christian church would always teach these things, but you don't, you don't hear in side B, you know, it's, 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 you have to really concentrate on all the terms they throw out, you know, they make up and definitions. Oh, there's same sex attraction, but then there's same sex sexual attraction. No, it's the same thing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's not be coy here. So it's, you know, the, the truth of Scripture, there's hard places of Scripture, but the saving truth is simple and it's repeated in many different ways. And it's glorious and it points us to Christ and it gives us hope and victory. We are victorious because Christ is victorious. Amen. And, and if I could just add something to this, you know, <clears throat> this is why I say that it's a different religion. I, you know, because I mean, it is a different side B gay Christianity is neo orthodoxy. It is not the Christian faith. And um, I, you know, when I have said that before, I've been, I mean, as you can imagine, I've been challenged by these, you know, aficionados of side B gay Christianity. And sometimes they will go out on a limb and say, you know, that Rosaria. You know, I know she is a spiritual sibling, but she is also a spiritual abuser. And, you know, I think I'm more offended by them calling me a spiritual sibling than I am spiritual abuser. I really mean it because I can defend myself against these dumb spiritual abuse charges, you know, like I can. But but I will confuse people if people say, well, that's all the same faith, you know, it side B, side A you know, Orthodox Christianity. We're just having a little intramural football game here. No, we're not. No, we're not. We've got competing religions. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to see it like that. And that's why I personally feel so strongly about this. Um, I was not just the lesbian next door. I was a gay rights activist. I wrote policy. I testified before the legislature. LGBTQ plus has moved from a pervasive sin pattern to our nation's reigning idol and my fingerprints are on it. Mm. So if it means I have to get scrappy with some broad evangelicals who need to go to therapy now that I've opened my mouth, so be it. But I'm praying that they'll repent. I'm praying that as Christians that we will not be so thin skinned that we will not be concerned about our reputations as much as we are our souls and the reputation of Christ. Amen. And it, what's funny, just what you're talking about, like if they applied 
the tone argument or hurting feelings, if they applied that to scripture, they'd never listen to the prophets. They wouldn't listen to anybody in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't listen to Jesus. Right. Right. So he, right. Jesus is first, you know, the first word of the gospel is repent. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, Jesus' own words to his disciples. Think about Peter catching a uh, get behind me, Satan. You think about what yeah. tone policing would do to something like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's like the word of rebuke is ruled out of bounds unless they need it to rebuke you for being uncharitable or mm -hmm. whatever, right? It's a mm -hmm. sort of that can only be used to police those who have said something that's unfashionable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or that might threaten the donor base see none of us right. here have that problem <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, occasionally people will give you a cup of coffee in the <laughs> elevator at a conference you know? <laughs> i have to confess that i'm here sort of representing the normies on this because um i mean really it was god's providential friendship with jared that kind of kept me from some of this. I mean, I, okay. I was listening to these people saying, look, I, I can't point to some reason I have an appetite for same sex sin. It just kind of showed up mysteriously. So I was going back to Jared and saying, man, I don't know. What are they? Uh, got a little uh, cameo here from my oldest son. <laughs> some clean laundry. Um, you know, I was saying, well, what are they supposed to do about this? Right. How are they culpable for this? And I remember at some point, I think Jared probably said it to me multiple times. But at some point he got through to me that to desire sin is sin. Right. And Absolutely. Mm -hmm. if you don't recognize it as such, you just cut off as Kent laid out, you cut off the route to deliverance from that sin, right? You have to name it as sin, mm -hmm. repent of it. This mm -hmm. is God, you know, God is inclined to forgive you and deliver you and, and sanctify you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, it felt compassionate at the time, but what yeah. you realize is, Oh, no, no, no. You're being monstrous to these people because mm -hmm. you're cutting off the only avenue of hope they would have. Yeah. Right. And I would also throw in, you know, often I've I've heard people say, um, you know, I have same sex attraction. I don't want it. I've prayed for God, for God to take it away. And you now this is usually I hear people on the Internet or you know something that's broadcast that say something like that. And I, I always kind of want to, you know, have a conversation with that person. It's like, you, you just don't pray that prayer mm -hmm. and expect God to change you. Mm -hmm. You have a responsibility in your repentance. Mm -hmm. And part of that responsibility is to avoid temptation. Mm -hmm. And there is usually a, if you have a besetting sin, mm -hmm. there is a common road of temptation. Certain times of day or night certain places might be certain people, things you read, things you watch. Um, you know, what, what are you doing to overcome that sin? What are you replacing that sin with in your repentance? What scripture are you bringing forth to combat that suggestion? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ and Jared, you, you talked about Jesus temptation. Mm -hmm. And of course you point out that there's, there's no inward corruption in him as opposed to you and I. So when we're, when we have temptation within, that means we've already did the sin, right? Mm -hmm. At least in our mind or heart. Um, but Jesus, when he was outwardly tempted by Satan, he came forth with the word of God quickly. Mm -hmm. He had passage to refute uh, Satan. He did not engage conversation mm -hmm. with Satan. He didn't consider the options. Mm -hmm. He wielded the sword rightly and i've told people i've counseled you know that this thing is some scripture verses that you're going to put in your pocket mm -hmm. that when you're tempted you're going to draw out and you're going to read them to yourself you should memorize them uh, not just one or two but a number of them uh, to fight the temptation mm -hmm. to overcome even if you send it send a bit mm -hmm. you know not to continue down the road of mm -hmm. sin so mm -hmm. Uh, we have to be responsible. We're not passive in our repentance. And if you think you are, and it's all God's work uh, to change your affections and your mind, and you're not doing anything, you're going to stay in your sin. No doubt about it. Amen. Yeah, I think we, we probably all know somebody who 
God providentially in, in incredible kindness sort of flipped a switch where they went from mm-hmm. one pattern to the next sort of overnight. Mm-hmm. But I mean, my own experience, uh, certainly in pastoral ministry, he works through means. He, mm-hmm. it, it's just his normal pattern. You know, you want to tell people like you got into this trouble over a long period of yeah. successive choices. You walked right. in a long path to get to this point. Mm-hmm. And the Lord's regular, you know, his normal pattern is that you will then walk out by making choices that honor him as Lord mm-hmm. rather than mm-hmm. just some sort of yeah. light switch, pixie dust sprinkling. It's all mm-hmm. fixed and going. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. repentance is lifelong for every step. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Amen. you don't check it off the list, and I don't want to be watchful. No. Yeah. yeah, so I want to pick up on if you if you'll let me, and it, it kind of circles back to something Rosaria just said a minute ago. Um, Rosaria, as a public figure in evangelicalism, one of the things I've most appreciated about you is that you have been willing to come back to the table and say, "Hey, I think I got this thing wrong um, back in the day, and and I want to correct that now." Mm-hmm. And uh, it, maybe it ties into what you said earlier about keeping the donor base happy. Um, <laughs> but I, I've said for a while that the defining mark of Big Eva is never saying you are wrong. And <laughs> as the cultural, you know, as some of the cultural trends have shifted a bit, I've, I've noticed, you know, I, I know we're not here to name a lot of names, but I've noticed some guys starting to talk out of both sides of their mouth, right? There was this thing they said on the record that was destructive and harmful. They, they've never went back and said, oh, I was wrong on that. They just now have this new... Um, this new uh, position that I want to, and please pretend like I didn't say any of that stuff previously. I'm I'm just curious, you know, what do you think is driving the reluctance to say I'm wrong? And then what resources in your life did the Lord provide to make that um, something you were willing to do? I I think that's a unique feature. And I'd just like to hear you talk about it more. Yeah, Jeff, I'm so glad. It's so funny. I, you know, It would never in my life have occurred to me that the thing that would bring the most shock and awe to evangelicalism was a Christian repenting. Like that's really scary to me. Okay. That's really nuts. I mean, that's nuts. Um, So I I think, well, a couple of things. Um, Progressive sanctification is just that it's, it's progressive. So you would expect that if, you are working out or living out um, your Christian life, you know, and, and you are transparent and the world is watching that you would be growing in grace. And as you're growing in grace, you would be repenting of sin and you would, would need to correct errors. And I would say, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of, 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 of homosexuality, um, the, not only, you know, not only did I, you know, was I on a losing team because I brought so much of that sexual sin into my Christian life and sexual sin, you know, it, it warps the mind, it, 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 it warps the affections, all of those kinds of things. But, but also, um, you know, as a professor of queer theory, I, you know, I have all that vocabulary too. And, and, and that vocabulary very quickly became the neologisms of the broad evangelical movement. So, so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I'm, I'm also a 19th century scholar. So I knew when the concept of sexual orientation, you know, it's not like it's as old as the pyramids. It's 150 years old. It comes Mm -hmm. out of Freud. It was, um, you know, it it presented an idea about ontology with the, which the gospel and the Bible clearly refutes. Um, So, you know, but but I was still, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to explain, but but it, it occurred to me that after a while, we were getting nowhere with these neologisms. I think the general idea, the general idea, and, you know, Aaron Rand talks about this with, um, uh, you know, positive world, neutral world, negative world. So, so all of this started very much in neutral world. And the idea was you would meet people where they are and you would bring them to, you know, lead them to Christ. And in lots and lots of ways, that's what happened to me. And so I was excited to be part of this, but then it, what, what started happening is we would meet people where they are and nobody ever moved. Right. And, 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 and that was really, off-putting mm-hmm. and upsetting. And, and I can't tell you how many friends I had 
who were side B who are now side A. And, and many of them, I mean, one culminated in a conversation a few years ago, this was just before my public repentance on these issues, um, where she said to me, Rosaria, it makes me really sad that one of us is going to go to hell if we don't change. And I thought, and this, you know, she's now quote unquote married, not, you know, to, to another woman. And I thought, well, yes, me too. But why do you think I'm going to hell? <laughs> Yeah. And she said, yeah. well, because you're hanging heavy burdens around the necks of gay people, which is an absolute flip of the millstone metaphor that 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 the Lord Jesus Christ uses. And, right. and it occurred to me, you know, a Bergefell, Bostock, Title IX, all of those three exchanges in Romans 1 have been exchanged. And we are now dealing with an idol. We're not just dealing with nice people and their nice problems, as Machen might say. We're dealing with um, a, a reigning idol. And the, the twin uh, efforts of the Reformation are to destroy the idols and to proclaim the word of God. And you can't, you can't not destroy the idols. Um, and, and so I, we was, I was reading um, the last uh, the, uh, two books, two books were really instrumental. And of, of course, you know, my husband and my, 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 my church, I mean, I, I sit under excellent preaching and teaching and, um, uh, but uh, Thomas Watson's book, The Doctrine of Repentance, actually calls course correction counterfeit repentance. Because mm. I thought, I thought, yeah, and that's good. Gosh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, no, it really is. Yeah, yeah, he calls it counterfeit repentance. Um, and mm. I, it, because what I was doing was obviously I don't sin alone, just like the rest of us here. And so um, some of the thing, you know, like uh, using transgender pronouns, calling reparative therapy a heresy using slogans like homosexuality is a, is a sin, but so is homophobia, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And there's a, a, a lot more. And I, I start, I, I wrote, I published a book this year that starts with, um, you know, I mean, the introduction is all about public repentance. And so um, it really just kind of, I, I, it was with great shame that I realized, oh, thank you, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> with great shame, we're going to hold up each other's books here, with great shame that I realized that I was engaging in counterfeit repentance. And so mm. I called, I talked to the people with whom I sinned and to a one, each and every one said, don't repent. It's, it's going to ruin, you know, it's going it, to, you don't need to repent. You've course corrected. You didn't intend to make the mistake and all this stuff. And I just thought, oh boy, this is, things are actually worse than I thought. And I had one person say to me, it's going to ruin your ministry. And I said, I don't have a ministry. I have a household. I, I'm married to this guy. And yeah. I don't think he's going to have anybody else homeschool the kids, make the communion bread. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't, you know, I have to, I have to repent. And one of the things I've, I've noticed is by, by virtue of marking those as sins, like by saying, I didn't just change my mind. I didn't just take the wrong exit on the highway. I sinned. This was a sin and I repent. I've been able to mark and avoid that for other people because it, it is a different, you know, it's one thing I, I think um, uh, I haven't, some of those sins I hadn't really committed in a while, you know what I mean? Cause so they were kind of back there in the, you know, in the recesses, but I wasn't able to mark and avoid those for other people, which means that I was leading in the wrong direction. And um, you know, one of the uh, one of the parachurch ministries that my session has not my husband primarily, but others on the session too have just said, "You're not writing for them ever again." At this point, you're not writing for them. And they had actually asked me to write the article on why I re why I think using transgender pronouns is a sin, and I said, "No, I, my session tells me I'm not writing for you anymore." But here's one reason I have no desire to. I'll write this article and you guys won't edit the gospel out of it because you know better. But then you're going to publish somebody else's article that says, here's, here's why we think it's a good idea. And it's going to look like we're having an intramural conversation and we're not. So I don't want to lend my voice to pluralism because that's not the gospel. So that was, um, so I would say that repentance, um, is a great joy of the Christian life. And quite frankly, if that meant that nobody would want to read this next book or would trust me, then I would trust that God could use a dead book as well as he could use a living book. And that would be fine. 
um, because what's ultimately important is that um, that I am a good witness to Christ and not and not a, a not a bad one. So if nobody out there is repenting, how dare we call anyone else to repentance? Mm. What business do we have? It makes no sense. Well, and maybe that maybe that's part of it too. You know, you're talking about meeting people where they are, but never moving them. No. That seems like the the long term fruit of the seeker sensitive movement, right? That yeah, we just all kind of get stuck in the mud there at the lowest common denominator. Um, yeah, I wonder if the credibility issue there is too. That for some for some reason, the people who know that we're imperfect, nonetheless, feel like we lose credibility by acknowledging, a, I got it wrong, and B, the Lord was kind enough to help me see my error. I mean, yeah. right. how in the world do we reach that point? Yeah. Well, I just want to <clears throat> share you know, something I learned a long time mm -hmm. ago, uh, reading Thomas Manton's uh, commentary on uh, James. Okay. And um, talking about confession. And you know, he made a point that confessing your sin brings glory to God. Yeah, you know, so when Amen, you confess bro. sin, you're you're confirming what God defines as sin as sin. You're you're confirming God's Amen. truth. Yep. And and the, f the first step in receiving the gospel and embracing it is to confess your sin. You can't ask for forgiveness before you confess. And so he used mm -hmm. uh, this wonderful, beautiful passage in the book of Joshua, chapter seven, verse nineteen. And this deals with uh, Achan, who stole from Jericho, Jericho uh, the Babylonian garment and the gold and hid it. And God brought a defeat in the next battle at Ai. And so God pronounced the death sentence um, upon the Israelite who was guilty. And then they had to find out by lots, casting lots, who it was. So the death penalty is already pronounced. Uh, this person will be killed. Uh, by commandment of the Lord. And then Joshua says in verse 19, now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Now, so he's, he's a condemned man. Um, of course, make it a cry out and ask for mercy from the Lord. Um, but confession of our sin brings glory to God. And that's part of our, our Christian liberty again. But a lot of people are hearing Satan. Mm -hmm. Do not confess sin. It brings shame. And shame is bad. You don't want to be shamed. And we, we, we all do foolish things or we don't do our duty out of shame or perceived shame. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know for myself, I did. I didn't. Uh, I, I did not confess Christ openly for two years after I was converted because all my family and all my friends and there, there were unbelievers and many were hostile and I didn't want to be alienated. I didn't want to be rejected, but you know, it was tearing me up inside uh, those two years. So uh, mm -hmm. confession, you know, liberates you from the bond of Satan. Mm -hmm. well, then it makes sense that that's a satanic temptation, one yeah. that our flesh would gravitate to. If if confession gives glory to God, well, Satan and our, you know our natural man, we're glory thieves, and so we're mm -hmm. going to resist uh, yeah. honoring the one who's worthy of all honor. So yeah, that makes a mm -hmm. ton of sense. Talk about neologisms, um, Jared. We have talked about. And I think it's in our notes for tonight. That phrase that gets tossed around about. I'm not called to be heterosexual i'm called to be holy um this seems like this would be a good time to kind of talk about that you want to bring that up at this point yeah i've heard i've heard several gay christians argue that and even pastors who are sympathetic towards that who would say they're against um side b christianity they say to tell you know a, a homosexual who gets saved to tell them that god's calling you to be holy not heterosexual I'm just curious y'all's thoughts on that. What do y'all think about that that phrase? Yeah, okay. So just a couple of things. Um, my Probably my closest friend in my Christian life is Christopher Yuan. And he wrote a book that that is close to what you're saying, 
but he's not arguing that in his book. So let me unpack a little bit of, sure. and I've, I've said things that are close to that. So you can call me on it. You can all call me on it and I'll, you know, but let, let me see if I can unpack some of this. When, when Christopher Yuan and I came to Christ, we came to Christ as Christopher would put it from out of a far country, right? You know, there's no little sign of us, you know, like Matthew Vines at a, at a, you know, the, his uh, little four-year-old, you know, church camp singing this little light of mine. And that's how he knows he's a Christian. Christopher, Yuan and I were not raised in that kind of context. So when we came to Christ, we came to Christ because of who Christ is, but our feelings did not change at that moment. At that moment, what changed was our heart's desire to follow Christ and our head's absolute conviction that Christ is risen, objectively so, and that that would be true whether we, you know, acknowledge it or not. It was just objectively true. And then what happened for both of us at different, you know, different time junctures, but what happened is that slowly and over time, our desires changed. And so one of the ways that when I have, when I am uh, meeting with someone who is not yet a Christian, but is indeed practicing homosexuality, the first order of business is who is Jesus? Um, and that was very much how Ken Smith dealt with me. He said, you don't, I can't talk to you about sin. Uh, what did he say? I can't talk to you about sins until I talk to you about sin nature. Because I, I, at one point I said, okay, I'm sure we're going to talk about my homosexuality. No, first we're going to talk about your sin nature. I'm like, what? You know, what? You know, unbelief is a terrible sin. It's a terrible, rotten sin. So the way that that phrase, so it, it, it's back to that question of discipling someone. And um, discipling a new a new Christian who has come out of homosexuality absolutely means encouraging that person to love what God loves. And what does God love? God loves biblical marriage. But it doesn't mean that that's not going to be a long discipling road. And we've, you know, I'm sure you have. I know Kent has. Um, you know, people who will get married in an effort to maybe avoid a sin problem only to find that that wasn't a good way to deal with your sin. So, um, so I think it's a discipling, it's a wisdom issue. It's a discipling issue. Here's where that, here's where that neologism is a disaster. Here's where it's just outright awful. When someone says, I'm a Christian. I've always been a Christian. I can't remember a time when I didn't know Christ, but I also can't remember a time when I wasn't gay. And they're using gay ontologically. They're saying, I am ontologically gay. This is who I am as a person. And then they're saying, therefore, because who I am as a person is gay, but also who I am as a person is Christian, I am called to celibacy i.e. holiness. And that's just a flat out sin. If you are in sin, you're called to repentance. You're not called, you know, to, to, to celibacy. You're, you're called to repentance. And, you know, the, the confession, Westminster Confession of Faith calls it, you know, chapter 15 calls it repentance unto life. It gives you new life. So I don't know if I've equivocated here, if I'm feeling kind of, you know, I mean, you could, you, could, you could get on me for that. You all can, all three of you can. But I think that phrase has been used in two different ways and I'd want to separate it. Um, but here's what I don't want to do. I want to make sure I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm prone to do this. Um, uh, you know, when um, I think it was uh, Al Mohler, he wrote an, an article on, in World Opinions about Andy Stanley and the, and the title was, The Train Has Left the Station. And I remember talking to Christopher Yuan about it. And he said, what do you mean the train has left the station? That train left the station in 2014. Remember, we were at the conference, uh, when we were, we were at a conference when Andy Stanley said, you know, unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. And then one of the things that Christopher pointed out, and I think this is right, he said, you know, we could play with this metaphor a lot. This is a good one. If you're on a train and it's going to the wrong station, 
Do you think that sitting on the train and talking to all the other people on the train about how you want to change the direction of the chain, the train is going to work? No, you need to get off the train. You need to get off the train. That's what you need to do. And so, um, so I think that expression has been used in two ways. One is to acknowledge that before you know Christ, it is almost impossible to understand what an indwelling sin is or how to fight it. But the way that it's used, you know, outrageously, disastrously wrong is to excuse sin in the name of a, of a pharisaical, um, and you know, what is the, this, uh, the, the larger catechism ca calls this the violation of making entangling vows of celibacy. And one time Christopher Yuan and I sat down with Greg Coles before he joined Preston Sprinkle's team. And we had a heart to heart talk about what the confession of faith says about entangling vows of celibacy. And um, obviously we haven't made headway yet, but we tried. All right. Did How amazing that the confessional tradition is still that directly relevant. I mean, they're dealing with something entirely different that celibacy binds them to, but it remains as timely as, right. you know, whatever shows up on your Twitter feed today. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's timely in another way. You know, I just like to remind people that it is the confession that calls the Pope, the antichrist. So if, if I've erred by using the, the terrible H word, as has Jared, um, I didn't scratch that part out in my confession. Sure, sure. Yeah, Francis makes that immediately credible, right? You, <laughs> you kind of watch what Francis does, and you're like, yeah, there's uh, there's not a lot of argumentation. But, but I don't know. What, if, what do you think about what I said? Do you buy that, or do you think I'm equivocating? Jared, you look like you're... I don't... You're, <laughs> um, I, I would not use the phrase at all, yeah. um, okay. but um, I understand what you're saying. I mean, we, we talked about it earlier. We're not saying that a switch goes off and all of a sudden the inclinations you had before you were saved, that you're no longer, the flesh is no longer to produce any, any sins that you used to be drawn to. You know, that, that's not what we argue. But like we, we what, what my concern is, is that if we're talking to a white supremacist, we wouldn't make statements like this. We wouldn't say God calls you to be holy, not to stop hating. Hate your brother. Yeah, yeah. You know, like we would, or we tell the thief, you know, the, the way Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians five talks about the thief is to be generous. And like, like those are the phrases that I would use. And since heterosexuality is the design of God in Genesis two, right. I would say, I would tell a person that, you know, drawing them to repentance. And like you said, loving what God loves, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that I would say that God will change you. And what I mean by that, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't put a timetable on it. Right. But he's going to change them. And it may be at death when we leave. The, like he, that. That's when all of us are permanently changed. Right. Uh, well, and Jerry, can I jump in yeah. there? It should also be an active ambition that you're cultivating. Yes. Right. Yes. Like it's like your tell loss. So my concern if we if we even use that phrase that you're called to holiness, not heterosexuality in any form, then you've just given them the tell loss of holiness and pitted it against God's design. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think that's right. And Jared, if I can quote you, I'm going to hold up your book now. I'm going to quote you. I really, I really, I just loved this. This almost brought me to tears. Moreover, pastors must remind their brothers and sisters in Christ that they do not fight because they will definitely overcome fleshly desires in this life. They fight because Jesus, not sin, not the flesh, is their Lord. They fight because his tomb is forever empty. And that is powerful pastoral advice. It is of utmost importance for pastors to help them base their fighting on objective truth rather than on their faulty subjective evaluation of their own progress. Self-evaluations really are not worth the trouble since one's discernment is faulty. Rather, pastors should encourage them to fight and keep fighting until eternity. Christ is worth the fight. No one has loved us like our triune God does. And those are powerful pastoral words. And 
Um, and yes, I agree. I think one of the real challenges is when you use neologisms and you try to build the gospel on it, you are going to be misunderstood. And furthermore, you're going to divide um, ideas that, that, that scriptures don't divide, such as sex and gender. Right. So no, I, but I, that's, that's marked in my copy. I had to, Kent had to have his own copy because my copy is, <laughs> is, um, I married, Kent says I married him for his library, but then we discovered we can't really share a library because I'm a messy reader. I read with him. I do know several of my books that I haven't seen for a while. <laughs> That's in right. her office. It's so. true. Yeah, brother, I am so sympathetic, man. My wife, now I've started marking books, but my wife was early to that. And every time I miss a book, the first place I go is her office. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> on the um, on, on the framing there, before we leave it too quickly, I noticed this among those who seem to want to, I noticed the phrase, not called to heterosexuality, called to holiness among those who want to skirt the confrontation of the matter. You know, nobody, I don't think anybody wants to deny that there is a broader comprehensive program called sanctification, holiness for the, for the Christian that is God's purpose for you. Right. But the framing creates this false dichotomy as if there's a route for me to holiness that can step around God's design for my sexuality. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think also it, rhetorically sets them up to kind of say, well, heterosexual desire and uh, homosexual desire, those are kind of the same deal, but we're all called to hold yeah, no, It seems like a rhetorical I, I think you're absolutely right. And I also think it reifies the, the category of sexual orientation as an anthropological category, which it is not. And it also sets up everybody to say, you know, change allowing therapy would be terrible. You should never do it because, you know, I mean, to quote, you know, I don't know why I'm quoting Greg Johnson. Why not? Uh, to quote Greg Johnson, 99.9% .9 of the time, it doesn't work. I mean, here, this is uh, Pat Allen. Just one. <laughs> is that okay? So, so anyway, I just, I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. We don't want to reify a false anthropology. And I think, too, Christians were just maybe not prepared to have to yeah. fight the battle at the level of nature. Um, but no, I, I think that we are all done here using pithy expressions and uh, neologisms. And um, as, as Kent said, we fight with the sword and not with uh, our own cleverness. Well, so, uh uh, one, you guys have been incredibly generous for your time, so I, I don't think I can keep you here all night, but I am really fascinated by the conversation. I'm awake. Um, I have a cup of coffee here. We're doing okay. Oh, that's a big cup, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Jared, you mentioned something a minute ago that I think is sort of, once you see it, it's a dead giveaway that everything is not right. Um if I go to sort of a parachurch conference and it's on some kind of sanctification topic dealing with a besetting sin, you know, you don't have the person, um, the person who's going to lead the breakout session on uh, spousal abuse is not a man who gets up and said, I live every day with a desire to beat my wife and children mercilessly. Right. The, the, the racial reconciliation conference isn't led by someone who says I'm tempted every day to put my clan hood on and go burn a cross somewhere. But for some reason with this, I mean, even the, even, you know, the sexual sin stuff, if the guy, you know, the, the thing on pornography is never the person who's like, ah, you know, I really had to fight really hard to not look at porn right before I came out on stage here. But with same sex attraction, it seems to be the experience that lends credibility and sort of sets up a platform for someone to talk about this from within the experience of same-sex attraction on a lot of parachurch conference platforms. And so I, I guess I'll roll that phenomenon over to you guys and say, why is that? Why is this the special sin that we treat in a way we don't treat any others? Uh, well, I think maybe several things. Um, you know, the, the church is not really immune from the culture, and we you know come from a you know postmodern world. Um, 
where you know your experiences, your feelings uh, define <clears throat> truth. So I think there's that aspect. Um, but uh, but also I know years ago, you know, over ten years ago, um, I had a, a pastor friend call me, and he was you know he was younger in the pastorate, made less than ten years. And there was a man, I think, in his, he knew, he was trying to disciple, who was struggling with uh, homosexuality. And he said he did not know how to counsel him because he has no experience there. <laughs> and I said, well, have you had experience being drunk? Did you need experience being drunk to counsel somebody who gets drunk all the time? No, no. Do you need to be? Do you need to have experience as a, you know, a habitual gambler to counsel somebody not to gamble? Um, right. Now we we all have sin, right? But we don't have to be, you know, experts through experience to define what sin is and what steps to take to avoid it sin and what repentance would look like. Um, so I think a lot of people just, you know, kind of cop out. They're just, they're, they're just, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't, I've never counseled on this, so, you know, I, I can't do it. So there's, there's a little bit of that, but then, so a lot of, some people have asked me, well, what, why is Rosario speaking and, you know, writing books and, you know, that's what pastors should do. Well, I'll tell you. You know, I know the conservative, the conservative pastors, uh, you know, many of them and many of the prominent ones in this country, um, they don't want to touch this uh, stuff. Hmm. They really don't. And, you know, kind of like we were talking about earlier, you know, they don't want the backlash. Um, yeah, I know they're just, they don't you know. We, there's a lot of things we have to learn in order to, to counsel on. Uh, I know in the past years, um, sexual abuse against minors. Mm -hmm. It's not a topic that I'm drawn towards. <laughs> it's not sure. a topic that it's pleasant to think about. Sure. But when it's in the courts of the church, or you know people who are hurt, they need counseling, you need to read up and understand the patterns of sin and, mm -hmm. um, and kind of the patterns of, of guilt of the victims, of false guilt uh, at times. Um, we need we need to study up on this. And, you know, homosexuality, again, I'd rather not talk about it. Transgenderism, I want to talk about that less. And, you know, but it, it is in front of us. It's in our face. Uh, it's affecting, affecting the people in the church. So we have to study it. We have to know it. Um, but people desire to hear from people who have been there and there is an important voice there, but um, I, I think the demand for that voice is pretty strong. And so I, I think that plays into it as well. Can I, can I just follow up on something? And you, you talked about a cop-out. Mm -hmm. The cop-out is not facing the reality of Genesis 127 and 128. That's the cop out. The cop out is um, conceding to the culture that homosexuality is an ontological category of personhood. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you have completely violated the idea of what it means to be made male or female in the image of God. Um, so it, it, it is it is an absolute violation of Genesis 127 to believe that gay is who you are rather than how you feel. It is an absolute travesty and violation of the word of God and of the blood of Christ to suggest that you are made in the image of God as a lesbian or as a gay man or as a non-binary whatever. Um, because gay and trans come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And bearing the image of God is done in the knowledge and the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus. And so 
you know, Jared and I know because we've recently tussled a bit in this area with some people, when you start to just call people out on this, um, you know, they worry about their donor base. They worry about their quote unquote ministry. Well, you know, we worry about the church. We worry about the, the, the reputation of the church. We worry about the, the cause of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ spilled not one, blop, one drop of blood for the parachurch. Those things are here today and gone tomorrow, but he will return to the church, his bride. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah. That's uh, it's really good. Hey, Jared, if I can set you up for another one. Um, <laughs> there's an interesting question I'd like to hear y'all talk about um, that, that's kind of in the notes. Are um, are these sins gendered? So, like, are uh, are sodomite appetites particularly masculine, or are lesbian appetites particularly feminine? And uh, I've never thought of that until I saw it in sort of the notes about what we wanted to talk about tonight. And if I can just sit back and listen to brighter minds than me talk about that, I'd love to hear uh, love to hear that discussion. Make the Mind who wrote that question talk about yeah, I'm not sure it. I understand that one. Well, I think it, it, I mean, Jared, you wrote the question, right? That's a Jared question. I did. <laughs> I think Jared should answer it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, the answer is no. <laughs> right. There is no, like, it's it's doesn't it? It shows what happens when you, when you, you know, extricate sex from gender. Mm hmm and then you build a theology on it. Um, it, 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 and you know, that sex gender quote unquote distinction, that was a feminist, uh, you know, that was like a feminist sacrament right there. You had to have the distinction between sex and gender because feminism pitted itself against progeny and patriarchy, babies and men. Um, and so it, it, you get all kinds of very bizarre um, you know, kind of, again, neologisms about what it means to be human when you do that. And one of the, I mean, to me, one of the really interesting questions is if you rail against biblical patriarchy, what do you think of transgender patriarchy? Because, you know, that's what you have. Mm. Um, so mm. this idea that somehow, and I've heard, I mean, I actually, that's an old, um, I, I didn't know if that's where you were going to go with it, but that's kind of like a that's like an almost an old 1970s, um, you know, old, uh, you know, kind of woman centered woman approach that you're more of a woman if you're a lesbian. But it's it's just the opposite. I mean, what what woman is the glory of man, mm. says First Corinthians 11. And so so the ultimate expression of of the fulfillment of God's design would be the bearing of children, the raising of children, the keeping of a house, the, you know, Psalm 113. I, so it would just be the opposite. But of course we twist, right? But what's unconscionable is that any of this gets a free pass in any church. Um, and I think that's where we just have to you know, we, we just have to soberly acknowledge that we live in a world with many, many false converts and with parachurch ministries that are fanning the flames of that. And that's a, that's a, that's, that's a very frightening and very sad situation. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's not something I really thought we would see to this extent in, in our, um, quote unquote Christian, uh, you know, context, but we see it. It's right here. Hey man, it's um, yeah, I I, I wrote that. Um, <laughs> True confession. <laughs> you know, I'm a I'm a hillbilly, so the just the the simple answer is that lesbianism is um, it is a woman looking at another woman the way that Adam looked at Eve. And, you know, uh, male homosexual desire is looking at a man the way that Eve would look at Adam. So by definition, it homosexuality is a feminacy at its very core. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm not sure what the term is for um, a woman who is masculine, mm -hmm. um, what the term is, but at its core, that's what both are. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of the side B folks, they want to sanctify and say, no, you can be a homosexual and a godly man. Mm -hmm. And and I want to say, no, you can't because mm -hmm. you, you have to be killing that effeminacy in order mm -hmm. to be a man because you're in the yeah. same way with it's called with, to be masculine right yeah you can't you can't be masculine and it's literally the the most effeminate thing you can do is to desire another man the way that a woman is supposed to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and right. vice versa and, so, um, and, and and i think that also speaks to the um dr peter jones talks a lot about this the the pagan roots of androgyny Mm. The, um, uh, you know, so sometimes within uh, homosexuality, you do have kind of a distinctive, you know, masculine woman or a distinctive effeminate man, but often you will have androgynous couples. And that is a, that is an expression of paganism, says mm -hmm. Peter Jones. And I think it's apt. He's absolutely right. All of the, the, the pagan gods and goddesses are indeed androgynous. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. I just read a book about Ishtar that made the okay. point that she could okay. swap back and forth. Yeah, uh, you know, back in the early two thousands, the first time I met kind of technological feminism, they were all yearning for the ability to get into an android body. Yeah, absolutely. That was sexless. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, and it, it I, makes and sense once you start getting first principles lined up. Sure. I, and as much as Kent says he doesn't want to talk about transgenderism, he's currently on record for, I think, being the only person I know who has preached not one, not two, but three sermons on the sin of you know transgenderism. So I, I think it's important to realize that this is not a theoretical conversation. For those of us sure. who go to school boards and defend you know, parental rights and you know, speak against the transing of children and, and, and the harm of this junk science, and you meet parents who have castrated their children and think it's a good idea. And you meet you meet children who are um, you know who are medical patients for life. And um, my our twenty year old son came you know comes with me to these things because he's my bodyguard. And and he he pointed out a couple of things really relevant to this conversation. You know, one was he pointed out that most of the uh, the the people who had been taking cross sex hormones were now walking with canes and walkers and they're they're in their 20s and mm -hmm. he said it's he goes to a public university and he and he lives at home and he said it's 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 that way at school too mom it's you know i think it's that brittle bone issue it's really mm -hmm. it's really serious um, you know the other thing that that i often think about is okay what would these parachurch ministries say if they were here i'm just curious you know what what would you know, what would Jen Wilkins from Gospel Coalition say? You know, she'd have to say something like, well, but, you know, you know, because she recommends you send your children to government schools. She'd have to say, well, this is still a good place to go to school. Well, you know, or maybe I'd get a lecture from West you know, Hill or or anybody from Revoice on how to humanize the trans experience. But who's actually standing there saying, no, absolutely not dangerous. Don't do it. There's actually a fire in the building, and we are sure. going to now pull the alarm. Sure. Um, if Christians can't do that in the public sphere, what we are saying is we have no gospel that goes outside of our little parachurch movement here. We have nothing to offer a hostile world. Uh, all we can be is a soft presence in this hostile world. And then you're just carrying, you know, water for the other team and, and everybody knows that it's so obvious. And so I do sometimes think about this because this is primarily where I live my life. I mean, we, you know, we have a small church and we you know, have a, a, you know, people who are better than I am at this, but they organize a team to go to, to school board meetings. And we've discovered if you have three people speaking and you have three minutes each, you can get a lot done in, you know, nine minutes. And especially since your opponents are all going to stand up there and waste their time trying to figure out what their pronouns are. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's something. So um, yeah. if the church can't speak to that, 
um, it's it, it's it's clear that it's really not leading the world. It's just on that same train that left the station, and it's just in a car about two years back. But we're not on that train, and um, and so we we're you know we're missing the parties, but um, but who wants that? Missing the parties. We're missing the parties. Jared, we're missing the parties. Yeah, it looks like a party animal over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to throw out a, a book title. I'm sorry. I, uh, I wasn't sleeping. I was yeah. looking something up. Oh, like my my wife is talking. I don't need to hear it. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. What's your book I think title? mentioned by a, a good book on transgenderism uh one by sam oh, uh Adriatus. Adriatus, yeah. um across the kitchen table talking about trans with your team so that came out this year it's terrific so uh, and sam okay. has special experience as a pastor he was a pastor in greenwich, greenwich village of mm -hmm. all places oh. for a number of years so he's dealt with a lot of people with um sexual sins of all sorts um so he's written several books um on, on various topics but this is his latest book and specifically addressing transgenderism and you know focusing on bringing scripture he's really good about bringing out scripture and uh, unpacking it really um in ways i never thought about um mm -hmm. and especially dealing with teens who, who might struggle or who've been influenced uh, yeah. because that's that's where the great tragedy is is that a lot of teens are just captured uh by this um and as as we all know so it's it's one thing if, if it was an adult problem but it's really taken captive of a lot of girls teens. especially it's, yeah girls girls especially, especially. one and out of four it's manifested in schools you know the public school sure. some christian schools too you know let's sure. be honest yeah, I have um, I have daughters, and um, I mean, I think every human being goes through some stage of what's going on with my body. What you know, mm -hmm. these changes are happening. It makes sense to me that a young lady at a particular age in her life is as she's learning how her body's changing. It's like there's a mm -hmm. there's an exit ramp. There's a there's an exit that can get off this train right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and it seems like there's a whole industry ready to, you know, mutilate her horrendously, mm -hmm. uh, and. and and there is that. right yeah. and also um my uh, denominations publishing uh, house uh, crown and covenant publications the gospel and gender identity uh, okay talks about transgenderism um and there's also uh, andrew t walker has a book let mm -hmm. god and the transgender debate and a lot of these things that one's been out for a while yeah yeah, yeah a lot of these yeah. are you know addressing one aspect uh, and um there there is no one defining book um and there needs more needs to be written for for sure because a lot of times it's about the science like our little booklet's more about is there really a science of the brain and so we deal with that one topic but people don't, don't talk about that much yeah um I, I think what's really an issue though right now at least back to the the school board and legislature issues is that we have a number of young women uh, detransitioners who are on the front line of these um, these lawsuits, right? Um, suing, you know, um, you know, uh, um, health establishments, even the um, American oh, Academy of uh, Pediatrics, um, and the same mental health comorbidities that led a person to want to mutilate her body did not go away because she did. Right. And it makes me very sad that we put these people constantly before uh, the TV cameras and just the, it, 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 it seems to me that the church should be able to stand in their stead. It really does. I mean, and I know these women personally, and I feel a little bit of a mother hen to them as well. And I, I, I don't, you know, meanwhile, while the church is busy, you know, with their parachurch ministries working on, you know, the right, you know, fun slogan for the next conference, um, they're, 
there is a, a profound need for the real gospel in these 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 places. And you know, our denomination, one of the one of our um, you know one of our core doctrines is the mediatorial kingship of Christ, and um, it, it for me it has really purified um, and clarified what it means to be a Christian to go before the civil magistrate and remind the school mm. board mm. that they need to repent not only of mm. their private sin but also their sins of office because yeah, Christ Himself. That's good holds an office. And, you know, we're just living proof here. You go to your school board meeting, you put your name down, you put your address down, you, you know, and, you know, people get mad. And I mean, it's not very unlike being a homeschool mom. You go into a room of people and you talk for three minutes and then everybody's crying. You know, it's not, it, it's, 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 I'm happy, you know, this has happened to me before. Um, but it's, you know, somebody has to stand in the stead of these dear women who, you know, who, 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 you know, and many of them are Christians and they, um, they long to have a body that could bear children or, you know, breasts that could, that could nurse a child or a future, you know, it, it is a very serious thing to keep cycling them in front of, those cameras, and I, I think, I think we've just become barbaric uh, in the in the church by by failing to to really body block them from those cameras and those criticisms. So there's a lot of Christian work to do on this subject, and and I think Jared's book is a really important one. It gives great clarity to a to a concept that is, um, it is central to um, Reformed and Protestant theology. And it's, a, it, its neglect will lead to either bankrupt Christian lives or worse yet, people who think they're Christians and they're not. And so um, not to mention that it's just taken us out at the knees and, and you know, we can't seem to go to the civil magistrate or to anything outside of our own little, you know, little soapbox and get anything done. And it's, 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 you know, it's an urgent time to be a Christian in the world. Um, well, there's not all these voices because, telling us it's unfaithful to try to influence the magistrate or to, to speak yeah. to the magistrate in a way that says you actually have an obligation under Christ's right. lordship to do certain things, you know? Right. Right. Well, I, I tend to think that the mediatorial kingship of Christ is, going to become one of the most significant doctrines, um, very, you know, just clarifying and helpful and, um, and, and needed and necessary. Um, because real Christians need to get out there and actually do real work, not because the world is watching, but because God is watching. Amen. Well, and we want to love our neighbors. I mean, that that's a fundamental, you know, and that's the rhetoric even of the, the big Eva folks, love your neighbors. Like, I need to get in the way of my neighbor being able to be mutilated. That would be a very that would be a really good way. way. To, yep. Yeah, that would be absolutely, absolutely. Um, Kent, yeah. the uh, if I've got the name right, Adriatus book you mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah, do you a, have it? A N D R E A D E S. I was going to ask you to spell it, so thank you very much. And I want you to know that that's my book, but it ended up on Kent's in Kent's office. Uh -oh. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it in months. Where's that? Where's my book? Somewhere. Turn about's fair play, right, brother? Turn about's fair play. <laughs> that's right. Right in the house. <laughs> well, actually, the last question I had sort of queued up here. We've done some of like what other books out there are you are we are we finding helpful would you recommend so jared i think we're all thankful for uh mm -hmm. less the flesh rosaria um i have all of your books thus far except the latest one i plan to remedy that very soon I'm, we're all very thankful for your writing we will send it to you you oh, will you will give us your address when we are done and we will send it to you <laughs> that's what i may just go to crossville and take jared's um <laughs> <laughs> But on that question, are there is there any title uh, or yeah. you know you say this speaker, this podcast, whatever, yeah, yeah. just anything we want to throw yeah. in the hopper that we think are are pulling on the rope in a healthy, helpful way? 
Yeah, definitely. Well, another person who uh, recommended Jared's book is Mark Jones. Mm -hmm. And his book, Knowing Sin, is a tremendous book. In fact, I think his third chapter is, I think it, it should be one of those chapters that should be um, collected and set apart. Um, and it's on, um, it's on sin's privation and, um, uh, you know, this, what it means, uh, he uses a lot of, uh, a lot of the Puritans, a lot of, uh, you know, Goodwin and um, sin's nature is understood as an ethical problem, not a physical problem. And so he unpacks mm. that. And I think it is extremely helpful. Um, I, I also uh, really like uh, Christopher J. Gordon's little booklet, The New Reformation Catechism on Human okay. Sexuality. And Jared, did I send this to you? You did. Oh, good for right. me. I'm so glad I did. See, Jeff, you've got, Jeff's like, what am I, chopped liver? Now there are two books that you said. Um, it's, it's, it's written according to the um, paradigm or the, just the, the progress of the Heidelberg Catechism. So it is written to specifically understand um, how the, um, you know, what original sin means, what, what, what that means in terms of your, you know, sexual uh, depravity and other things like that. And, and uh, Christopher J. Gordon is actually Christopher Yuan's pastor out there okay. in Escondido, uh, okay. California. Um, I was sharing earlier that a book that, um, that Pastor Ken Smith gave to me that reminded me a lot of Jared's as I was reading Jared's. In fact, it was, it's been a long time since I've read this book. So I'm like, oh, this is so important, but it reminds me. And it's because it reminded me of the book that a good pastor gave me that set me to uh, to rethink what I thought I knew. Um, and it's, it's uh, by Chris Lungard called The Enemy Within, straight talk about the power and defeat of sin. And really it's just a kind of contemporary way of, of bringing to light uh, uh, John Owen's concept of indwelling sin. Um, yeah. um, and Owen's always good. And, and Owen's always good. The um, we made a reference earlier to uh, Thomas Watson, Puritan, the doctrine of repentance. Yeah, okay. uh, and it's it's so very thorough, and that's another thing that's not taught in mm -hmm. most Protestant churches today. Mm -hmm. Repentance, repentance you know, unto life. Yeah, you, you, you know, don't don't expect you know the assurance of forgiveness if you aren't practicing repentance and we all need reminders so it's the right. type of book that you need to read and reread and um, it's full of scripture and talks about what's false repentance um counterfeit repentance yeah, yeah that was really mm -hmm. you know another thing that i think is important for people who are struggling against or not you know who 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 are falling into the sin of homosexuality you, you need to realize that in some ways, it's no different than any other sin, but in other ways, it's very different. It's the only sin written into the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It's the only sin codified by law as a grace. And so you need to see it and understand that you are fighting not only the deeds of the flesh, but you are also fighting this satanic, idolatrous you know, world out there. And a book that is extremely helpful is a book that Kent's leading us through in our book study at church, um, precious, remedies. precious remedies against Satan's devices. But yeah. And you know, the last chapter of it, Oh, this, I love this chapter. The last chapter has six characteristics of false teachers. Hmm. Oh, Jared, I should have sent that to you before you, uh, before <laughs> you decided to stand with me in the, in the fray these days. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know, but it's really Thomas Brooks and it's just such a clear book, such a good book, but people who are struggling with homosexuality are, they're fighting on two fronts. And, and I think that's why they need to be warned about the false teachers out there. That's the other thing. That's why we can't pretend this is an intramural sport and you can nod and smile and say, well, maybe, you know, there, there are some good things, you know, he says he's conservative. No, sure. 
No, we need to actually warn them against these wolves because they are wolves. And uh, here, here. Brooks yeah. helps you come up with your with your checklist, with your wolf checklist, if you don't have one. Yeah, the identifying features of a wolf. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's super helpful. Yeah, so uh, listeners, if you're going to catch this uh, later, we're going to turn it into an audio-only uh, podcast and send it out. I will try to put the bibliography here in uh, in the show notes, so check those. Um, check, is there uh, anything you're going to add in? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one we should add in for this sure. One book <laughs> that she forgot to mention. <laughs> that is excellent as well. Yeah, so It's cheaper if you don't buy it from Amazon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Where can I, where, where should I get it? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Reformation, Reformation Heritage. Heritage usually have it sells. Um, Crown Covenant probably sells it. Um, yeah. Cross, Crossway had a, a sell for a while, but yeah. I think uh, Reformation Heritage, you know, you can get like two books. Yeah. And there are other really good sell. books at Reformation Heritage. Oh, yeah. So, but, you know, well, the other books we were recommending. Well, yeah, the, everything the would be there. Would be yeah, because that my book won't be on right. Amazon uh, uh, for long because at some point somebody at Amazon is going to realize that I say that transgenderism is satanic, and that might, you know, that might do it. Mm. So. <laughs> well, that's why I, if I can buy a book not on Amazon, right? Uh, I right. do my best. I find any other way I possibly can. Right. <laughs> yeah. it, it takes like like yeah, I appreciate. You know, the people people call it blunt, but it's just biblical. I mean, somebody, you know, well, Rosaria, forthright. Is, forthright, forthright is a good Rosaria, category. Kent, y'all need to write a book together on tone and just, <laughs> do, just do it from the Bible. Just talk about biblical tone. Because mm. um, well, if we're good. giving the Butterfields assignments, and I'm, I'm quite happy to do that, uh, Kent, those sermons on transgenderism also uh, being That's, published might be a very helpful pamphlet or whatever you want to do with it. You know? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I only did um, three, but yeah, a lot more could be done if you know more thought was you know, given to it. I mean, brother, the three would probably be as much as is available. I mean, uh, you know, there's yeah. still we're still in a dearth of mm -hmm. biblical wisdom applied to this topic, so. If yeah. I can be winding your sales at all, I I would pay to get a copy of those. Yeah. Well, sale, yeah. I mean, that's you know a topic that has not been written or taught on you know by Christians in previous ages. Right. Um, you know, if we're talking about surgery, I mean, it just wasn't around. Uh, you know, men trying to be women or dress up like women. You know, we we had that for you know centuries. You know, thousands of years, but yeah, it's a, it's a new challenge uh, to the church. But you know, the answers are in the scripture, and I mean, we can come up with quick answers, but we can, you know, spend time and have more thorough answers. And uh, I think that's where Sam Andriatis, um keep mispronouncing his name every time. You know, his book I mean, is it's really, not an easy one. Well, I'll give yeah, you yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. a you know not a normal. Talk one. about transgenderism with your team. That's yeah. That's the, yeah. But I, we'll send you, why don't we send the links to your sermons so you could oh, have really? those too. We can do yeah, that. Very much yeah. right. on your website. Man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, let's uh, do it. Yeah. But Ken, if, you will, if you make those books, brother, that like a, that book, that catechism that Rosaria shared earlier, mm -hmm. it would be at least that big, right? I mean, you could, you could do it. And, mm -hmm. and it, you could argue um, what you've argued would probably set the foundation for arguing against transhumanism too. Which is oh absolutely like the bigger dragon yeah. behind yeah it's coming yes. it's yeah. coming fast as soon yeah. as Elon Musk this uh, chip or whatever that that oh. Neuralink that he's uh, doing human trials right now um, I mean that's going to be like I, I think that's going to be the next big thing mm -hmm. that we're having to fight and you can you can help folks think mm -hmm. ethically about mm -hmm. about that yeah well everything we read about in the first three uh, chapters of uh, well, especially the first two of Genesis is mm -hmm. being attacked. Mm -hmm. Much of it has been attacked already for a long time. But yeah, just being a male, what is the male, what is the female, mm -hmm. which pagans long ago would not argue with the Christian no. view. Right. Um, it's being attacked severely. So, uh, 
Yeah. Well, I also thought about writing a book, you know, this is the gospel mm -hmm. to explain biblically, you know, what is the gospel, which mm -hmm. we don't have agreement on that. So. Yeah, brother. I think you're yeah. exactly right. I, I have Greg Gilbert's little book, What is the Gospel? And I've passed it around, but uh, a fuller treatment, you mm -hmm. know, from the reform tradition particularly mm -hmm. would be great. So, guys, we've got several books for y'all to write. I'm not sure <laughs> you know, when the conversation's over, but break out the quill. And <laughs> repentance, right? Like y'all, y'all got to write that book on repentance too. Yeah. Repentance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Thomas Watson wrote that book. Oh, too. there you go. We yeah. can't, we can't yeah. improve on that one. That's why All right. like, well, we'll, we'll take maybe, that one off the to do list. You know, take okay. bits out of it and mm -hmm. have a small book, but no, it's really good. You know, but I mean, well, I mean, that's what you know, Calvin said. He pretty much rewrote Augustine, right? Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, he was, you know, brilliant. a little more thorough and <laughs> yeah. he, he, he did a lot, of, a lot of work himself. So, oh, yeah. well, I'll tell you all this too. I don't, I don't know what the ethical parameters are on this, but my books are full of helpful books that I can no longer recommend to people because of what happened to the author afterwards, you know? Oh, yeah. And yes. I have thought I'm, I'm going to have to have a rewriting project. Yeah. I'm going to have to sit down and say, how do I rearticulate this information mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't feed people onto the bad stuff mm -hmm. that you got into? I mean, there's, there's a whole retrieval project out there just in the last handful of years you know? yeah yeah well that's what i like about the puritans they're dead <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> man I, I they're not really wacky now, now. <laughs> yeah. make sure all your heroes are dead and i'm i didn't listen and, uh, <laughs> well hey friends thank y'all so much for your time um yeah. If y'all will let me, I'm going to pray. I'm going to close this in prayer. Uh, I'm going to pray for God's blessing on your household, your work, and mm -hmm. also for Jared. Um, and then um, we'll we'll send y'all off to uh, hopefully a good night's rest. So <laughs> All right. join me in prayer, if you will. All right. Thank you. Uh, Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to sit down and talk about uh, challenging topics, uh, but also ones that the church really needs to be thinking carefully about in light of your word. And so I'm thankful for the Butterfields. I'm thankful for... Um, Jared and the way that they have given uh, their energies and the gifts that you have given them towards these topics. I pray your blessing on all those things, Father. Please bless the families that are represented here. Bless the households. Bless the various vocational callings. Use all these things to bring glory to Christ and to help those who bear uh, your image in him. And so, Father, uh, we know that's your desire. We know that you're making much of Christ, so we pray you keep doing it. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, brothers. Right. Yeah. Hey, thank y'all so much. Y'all have a wonderful night. Thank, thank you. Right. you. Thank and you so much. Jeff, really definitely enjoyed. send us your address so we can send you some books. Well, that is super sweet of you. And uh, <laughs> I'll probably take you up on that. I'm, okay, I'm, uh, sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's kind of you. Good night, brothers. Right. Lord bless you. Right. you thank you.